I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize he was a PhD from Mysore University and I should be referring to him as Dr. Aditya Sondi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gupta, for that kind introduction, Mr. Acharya, my esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my thanks to the Bar Association of India for this invitation to speak to you on the BSA. I'm also grappling with the Sanskrit uh, Hindi, maybe in due course uh, I will get the phrases right. I had the uh, privilege of making a presentation before the parliamentary committee leading up to these three laws. And uh, there, of course, I didn't focus so much on the Evidence Act as much as uh, the other two enactments. And I think when we're looking at the evidence law, as Mr. Gupta mentioned, we need to look at it in the overarching umbrella of the three laws together and their effect on the concept of rule of law. A citizen-friendly law may lead us to ask a question as to which side of the fence the citizens stand. Are citizens uh, bloodthirsty for justice or are citizens keen on a human rights-based criminal jurisprudence which takes into account the rights and protections available to the accused? And I share the view of the earlier speakers that this entire exercise of formulating this new criminal architecture really could have been avoided in the first place by way of appropriate amendment. And if it had to be undertaken, I think there were many, many other facets of criminal law that required to be addressed which have not been done. I won't go into the substantive law except to say on the substantive statute, on the BNS itself, read with the procedural code, considering how far Indian jurisprudence has gone on the death penalty sentencing and conviction, conviction matters. This was a golden opportunity for us to legislate a completely new regime on death sentencing. If not abolitionist, at least reformist. We missed that bus. In fact, we have introduced more sections with death penalties. But that said, I come to the BSA. Now, the first point I want to make is that this is an evidence act that applies both to civil and criminal proceedings. We must keep that in mind. So in trying to focus on a revamp of criminal law, collaterally, we have now also introduced a new evidence act for civil proceedings. I wonder how much thought has gone into the effect of this law upon civil proceedings to be initiated after the commencement of this act, that is July 1st. Interestingly, the preamble to this act says an act to consolidate and provide for general rules and principles of evidence for fair trial. Now, fair trial, in my understanding, generally is a phrase that is used qua criminal procedure. That's not to say it is inapplicable to civil proceedings. But I think with the focus on a reform on criminal law, willy-nilly, we've now brought in a new evidence law which will apply to civil proceedings, and I'm not sure how much we have thought about those implications. Having said that, I am firmly of the view that if these three laws had to be introduced, the Evidence Act should have been a special criminal evidence act. This is not alien to jurisprudence. There are many jurisdictions in the world where you have special police and criminal acts that deal with evidence only for prosecution and criminal matters. The UK has it, Canada has it. This was a great opportunity for us. And there are many elements to criminal trials which are peculiar hostile witnesses, stock witnesses, tutoring also. They may overlap to an extent with civil trials, but their effect, again, from the rule of law perspective, is more pernicious, more particular in criminal trials. We could have, in fact, looked at a special uh, criminal evidence act, which unfortunately we did not. As was said earlier, by and large, it is a repackaging. Most of the provisions under the old act find themselves couched in the new act, maybe in different clauses, etc. In essence, one and the same. The interesting part is the provisions dealing with electronic evidence. Now, this entire regime of electronic evidence under the Evidence Act itself was 
is superimposition. Because when the act was brought into force, obviously Mr. Stephen and others were not thinking about mobile evidence or electronic evidence for that matter. And we know from experience the difficulty in dealing with electronic evidence as to its admissibility, mode of proof, and how it impacts the outcome of trials. And I don't have time to go into it except to say series of judgments, Sandhu, Anwar, and Arjun Pandit Rao have taken diametrically different positions. And I have myself been involved in cases, 302 cases, where the investigating officer, those were the early days of 65B, unaware of the requirements and rigor of certification, simply chose not to have those certificates filed in court. And these were circumstantial evidence cases. I was for the victim. These were cases where there was no direct evidence. And the offense could not be proved simply for want of 65B. And questions arose there. Was the requirement of electronic evidence a matter of admissibility or was it a mode of proof? And this is very important because if it is a, an admissibility issue, then whether the accused objects to it or not, there is a threshold bar. The court can't look into it. But on the other hand, from the interest of justice perspective, in cases such as the one that I was appearing, where the accused has not raised an objection to the call records being marked and exhibited, could you still say that there is some bar to relying upon that evidence or could it be said to have been waived? I think this issue was at large. Sandhu said something, then Anwar said something else. Ultimately, in Arjun Pandit Rao, the Supreme Court said, no, it's mandatory, it's an admissibility issue. However, it can be produced at any stage. Now, this required series of judgments of the Supreme Court. The impact of this ambiguity on trials at every stage was different. It's a different matter who gets the advantage. In some cases, the accused may get the advantage. In some case, the prosecution may. But in either case, it does not sit well with the idea of rule of law that you have ambiguity on something as important as this. And today, in any criminal trial that you look at, you are by and large going to rely on call records, on CCTV, on video evidence, on emails, on WhatsApp chats, on Telegram chats, and so on. And this could have been, I think, the heart of this special uh, criminal evidence act that we could have enacted. We have not done it. What we have done instead now is a contradiction in terms. You have clause 57 of the BSA, which speaks of primary evidence. And in explanation 4 and 5 to 57, the law reads that where an electronic or digital record is created or stored and such storage occurs simultaneously or sequentially in multiple files, such each such file is primary evidence. And 5 also says, where an electronic or digital record is produced from proper custody, such electronic and digital record is primary evidence unless it is disputed. So the owner shifts. It then requires the accused to dispute that evidence, failing which it is primary evidence and therefore admissible. That is the first blush reading of 57 with 61. And 61 of the new BNS says, nothing in this adhiniyam shall apply to deny the admissibility of an electronic or digital record in evidence on the ground that it is an electronic or digital record and such record shall subject to 63 have the same legal effect, validity and enforceability as other documents. So on the one breath, we have elevated electronic evidence now to primary evidence, but subject to 63. Now when you come to 63, it's a non obstante clause. And it says, notwithstanding anything contained in this adhiniyam, etc., etc., such electronic record shall be deemed to be also a document if the conditions mentioned in this section are satisfied. And those conditions take us back more or less to what 65B required. And we are now left with the same conundrum. Is it an admissibility issue or is it a mode of proof issue? On the one breath, you say only if disputed. Let us say the accused does not have proper advice or a good defense counsel, does not dispute the electronic record. Then what happens? Is there a bar on admissibility? Can the Sessions Court still look into it minus the certification under now 63? Or must it, must it say that disputed or not, there is a, an issue 
as to the very admissibility of this document. And I'm surprised we could not think of this. We've had judgment after judgment. If you read Arjun Pandit Rao, the last few paragraphs of that judgment, the Supreme Court has been at pains to say that we need reform in 65B. And they have pointed to the law in Canada in particular to say there, there is an option to cross-examine. If in cross, you can impeach in some way the credibility or let us say not credibility, but the accuracy or the believability of the electronic evidence, there is scope for the Sessions Court. But it, there, there aren't such threshold requirements to lead evidence. And here we say on the one breath that it is uh, uh, primary evidence, and on the other, we subject it to the rigors of certification, etc. I'm quite sure the same predicament that was faced over the years with 65B will now be faced with this entire gamut of electronic evidence. Now, one other point I want to make is the very application of this BSA. Sir, you said goodbye to Evidence Act, but I think we have to say goodbye, but see you soon. <laughs> because the Evidence Act and the IPC and CRPC are not going anywhere. And the repeal and savings clauses will be, I'm quite certain, subject to much interpretation. When does the new set of laws apply? It's no easy answer. If I look at this BSA itself, 170, the Indian, Indian Evidence Act is hereby repealed. Notwithstanding such repeal, if immediately before the date on which this adhiniyam comes into force, there is any application, trial, inquiry, investigation, proceeding, or appeal pending, then such application, trial, investigation, proceeding, or appeal shall be dealt with under the provisions of the Indian Evidence Act as in force. Now many questions come to mind. I'm quite certain, sir, this is going to require uh, constitutional benches again to interpret it. And these provisions you will see also in the new procedural law. And obviously in the penal law, you cannot retrospectively have penal provisions. The constitution forbids it. But even on procedural law, the general rule was it is retrospective unless otherwise stated. Now both these procedural laws, the Evidence Act and the BNSS say they are prospective. But how do you interpret this? Now, what is the meaning of trial, inquiry, investigation, proceeding, or appeal? When does trial commence itself? The BNSS is silent on. You have to now then go back to Supreme Court judgments, which said trial is deemed to commence when charges are framed. But that itself is a matter of judicial in interpretation. So we don't know really when trial is deemed to commence. Is it when charge sheet is filed or when charge is framed? Let us take it that when it is charged, but this also speaks of investigation. So supposing investigation is commenced, the old act will apply, both CRPC and evidence. And the law is, under 170 of this, is shall be such application or investigation shall be dealt with. Dealt with or proceeded with. Does it mean the investigation can be under the old acts, but the trial under the new? And how will that impact rights of parties? I cannot say. Again, I say it can impact either ways, but it does not sit well with the rule of law. But the general sense is these, this architecture is pro-prosecution. Having said that, it can work both ways. And interestingly, this 170 speaks of proceeding, but it does not speak of suit. Now you will have to interpret proceeding to include a suit because this Evidence Act applies also to uh, civil proceedings. What was the difficulty in mentioning it? I think it's a faux pas because you were never really thinking of the impact of this on civil law. I'm running out of uh, time. I want to make one uh, concluding uh, statement, which is to say that I think now with criminal law in India, we have come to the conclusion, at least I personally have, I'm sure Mr. Gupta will share that view, that the focus in criminal litigation has become far more emphasized and focused on bail jurisprudence than actual trials, right? And as a result of which, I think there was a need for us in this Evidence Act and in this entire exercise to formulate special provisions to deal with this whole concept of prima facie. Today, criminal proceedings are decided prima facie. When I say decided, I don't mean finally. 
बट फॉर ऑल प्रैक्टिकल पर्पजेज ये दिस प्रोसेस इज द पनिशमेंट बहुत सुना है बट अब देख रहे हैं वी आर सींग दैट यू लुक एट द जजमेंट यस्टरडे इन शोमा सेंस केस सिक्स इयर्स इन कस्टडी सुप्रीम कोर्ट सेज प्राइमा फेशा वी डू नॉट फाइल मटीरियल यू लुक एट द जजमेंट इन जी एन साई बाबाज केस एन इंडाइटमेंट ऑफ द ट्रायल कोर्ट इट्स नॉट ए केस ऑफ बेनिफिट ऑफ डाउट द हाई कोर्ट सेड इन इन द सेकेंड राउंड ओवर that the trial judge really proceeded on a basis of no evidence where does this evidence act or the new courts deal with situations where trial judges are proceeding to deny bail and ultimately convict in very serious offenses without evidence should there be no consequence there and therefore i think there is friends a need for a prima facie evidence act i don't know what the sanskrit i do not know what the hindi or sanskrit equivalent of it is but i think it's very important because the larger criminal uh, law works out not just under ipc or bns it works out under special statutes and we are seeing now under pmla uapa ndps etc the entire uh, jurisprudence is different in terms of burden of proof in terms of the manner of uh, leading evidence effect of confessions etc this was again i think friends a golden opportunity if we had to redo and reinvent the wheel we should have actually then looked at the impact of these procedural and evidentiary provisions under special laws look at them under the general act and then codify so that you could have a fairer legislation i think that ultimately would lead to the you know the spirit of the rule of law thank you very much